fight. Mortal Kombat has been one of mainstream media's top competitors for over 30 years. Best known for its gory series of trailblazing video games, the powerhouse franchise has also headlined films, TV shows, comic books, and web series that range from pretty good to completely embarrassing. <laughs> Mortal Kombat's decades-long win streak may seem like a flawless victory, but the brand has had its fair share of struggles, resulting in the loss of numerous games, characters, shows, films, and comic books that the world has still never seen. On this Lost Media Monday, we'll take a deep dive into the series' crypt of cancelled plans to see the best and worst of MK's axed ideas. So consult your Elder Gods and leave a like as we explore the Lost Media of Mortal Kombat. In 2015, DC Comics began publishing the Mortal Kombat X comic series. Set between the events of the 2011 reboot and the namesake MKX, the series adapted fringe elements of Mortal Kombat's 3D era canon into a story that blasted open the scope of the post-MK9 world. The comic would end after its first volume, spanning 12 issues in total, but writer Sean Kittleson revealed that when production began, the team was told two would be produced. In a 2020 interview with History Behind the Warrior, Kittleson discussed his ideas for the potential plot of the second volume. Sub-Zero would have hosted a tournament to find his next apprentice, with him and Frost developing a similar relationship to Scorpion and Takeda. Goro, who had lost his arms by the end of Volume 1, would have allied with Dagon and the Red Dragon to find the last great dragon egg, located at the Linkway Temple, to become the new host of Onaga. After ambushing the tournament, Goro would fight his way to the egg and become the new Dragon King. While this happened, Dagon would hope to use the shift in power to invade Outworld and kill his brother, MK Armageddon's Taven, who was still asleep. The heroes would have used Kenshi's sword to seal Onaga, with Dagon finding that Taven has already woken up, opening the possibility of Armageddon's events repeating in the new timeline. Sub-Zero's failure to protect the egg, and Onaga's awakening, would have also resulted in a more strained relationship between Earthrealm and Outworld, with Kotal Kahn losing faith in Earthrealm and playing into the events of MKX's story. Kittleson didn't elaborate on the reason for the second volume's cancellation, but its loss is one for the series as a whole. Mortal Kombat X's comics were almost undeniably the best to be released for the franchise, and with fresh takes on old ideas like Frost, Onaga, and Goro, Kittleson's plans could have led to the most compelling tie-in works MK has ever had. MK vs DC was a game that didn't end up burning much of a shelf life. Its single player lacked any meaningful experience beyond story mode, its online was an absolute cesspool, and the game never received any DLC. By the end of its lifetime, the game's infinite combos and spotty online were never fixed, and its roster never expanded beyond a shallow 22 characters, none of which were lizards. Compare this to MK Armageddon, which had 63 characters and at least 3 lizards. This wasn't due to a lack of effort though. In November of 2008, Ed Boon told Game Daily the DLC for the title wasn't far off, stating he'd like to have it out by the holiday season. Unfortunately, Midway's messy financial situation got in the way of those plans, with the company filing for bankruptcy in February of 2009. While this would normally end any possibility for more content to be released, Midway's assets, including Mortal Kombat, would be acquired by Warner Bros, who now owned Mortal Kombat and the DC Universe. While this sparked hopes that the game could still see additional updates, months went by with no word from the MK team, who are now part of the freshly rebranded WB Games Chicago. I don't know you! In June, Boone dropped a bombshell by casually announcing through a Twitter reply that the team had quote, pretty much finished Quan Chi and Harley Quinn, but that a potential release was now in limbo. In July, Boone would put the final nail in the game's coffin when he tweeted that he wished the team could have released DLC, but gave fans a look at Quan Chi as a parting gift. As of 2023, Harley Quinn's render has never been made publicly available, and no gameplay of either character has ever been released. Mortal Kombat Nitro was a planned SNES port of the first MK that would have served as an update to the system's first, more family-friendly port. Created by Acclaim, MK Nitro was intended to improve on previously released versions of Mortal Kombat for Nintendo systems, which up to that point had removed fatalities and replaced blood with sweat. 
Nitro would have featured increased speed and gore, new graphics, new movesets, and playable bosses. Leaked design docs focused on Johnny Cage, for example, reveal he would have worn gold shorts, with his special move effects also changed to gold. Eventually, the port would be cancelled to shift focus to the upcoming Mortal Kombat 2. Attention was brought back to the project after it was mentioned by Ed Boon in a 2010 interview, and ROMs of the game are known to exist in the world, though haven't been dumped for public download. Prior to the reveal of the cancelled Acclaim project, the Nitro subtitle was known by fans for its relation to an entirely fake game. Boon once revealed Mortal Kombat Trilogy Nitro Edition, a 4D port of MK Trilogy for the 32X, Atari 7800, and other outdated systems, including a port for the Game Boy. This, of course, was a joke, but it's one fans were unaware had ties to a project that was once very, very real. The future of Threshold Entertainment's Mortal Kombat film seemed doomed to the nether realm after the failure of MK Annihilation, but efforts to make a third entry in the series would last into the mid-2000s. In 2001, Drew McWeeny was hired to write a script for a potential sequel, with Threshold's MK film site adding a poll asking fans who they thought would survive the next installment. Things would go quiet until 2004, when reports would emerge that a new movie was in the works. Lyndon Ashby and Christopher Lambert would confirm their involvement as Johnny Cage and Raiden, respectively, in subsequent interviews. Robin Cho, who played Liu Kang, and Chris Casamasa, who played Scorpion, were also set to return. Gone, however, was New Line Cinema who handled distribution for the previous films. In 2004, Russell Mulcahy, director of Highlander, was reported to be leading the project, with Threshold's Mortal Kombat site announcing the film's title, MK Devastation. Filming was intended to begin in fall, with rumors stating that the film's plot would ignore the previous entry, MK Annihilation, entirely, replacing its story and leading into another sequel to form a divergent trilogy. But a hidden plot synopsis on Threshold's site, written from the perspective of the wind god Fujin, does acknowledge Annihilation, implying that at some point, Devastation was meant to be a more direct sequel. While Devastation's announcement was successful for Threshold, its production would be anything but. The screenplay would go through multiple revisions, with McWeeny himself not even sure if anything he wrote made it to the script shown to cast members like Ashby and Lambert. Mulcahy would leave as director before the end of 2004, and was reportedly replaced by George P. Costamos in 2005. Threshold was set to begin production later that year, with big plans for Devastation's filming. The company planned to purchase over 100,000 square feet of land to create a hybrid film studio and amusement park. The site would be based in Louisiana, and would begin producing the new Mortal Kombat at the end of summer. This was Louisiana at the end of summer. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina's devastation, Mortal Kombat devastation was put on hold. Chris Casamasa stated filming would pick back up in 2006, possibly in New Mexico or Thailand. But according to Ermac actor John Medlin, producer Lawrence Kasanoff had put Mortal Kombat on the back burner to focus on another film. If you're watching this video because you like lost media, then it's probably a film you already know about. Eventually released in 2012, Mortal Kombat Devastation was shelved for eventual 2000s lost media legend, Food Fight. Survival of the fittest, lad. Plans to resume filming never materialized, with Costamos eventually leaving, and rumors stating that if filming ever started, it would be directed by Christopher Morrison, known mononymously as Mink. But by the time Kasanoff shifted his focus back to MK, over a decade had passed since the release of Annihilation, not seeing a reason to make a sequel to a film seen as equal parts unwatchable and unlikable, Kasanoff launched Devastation into the Deadpool, finishing the series for good. This wouldn't be the end of their plans for the franchise, though, and it wouldn't be long until Threshold found a new way to beat their favorite dead horse. Despite MK Devastation's failure to launch, Threshold and Kasanoff are far from done with the series, but with nearly a decade having passed since Annihilation's release, the idea of a sequel that both acknowledged the film and reminded audiences of its now infamous existence was seeming less palatable. In 2007, reports emerged that work on a new Mortal Kombat had taken a hard shift in direction, opting to ignore the previous franchise entirely and focus on a new standalone film centered on Sub-Zero. These rumors would be confirmed 
confirmed when Robin Sho revealed he was out as Liu Kang, stating in a fan-made FAQ that the studio's current vision was for a new project to take place before Liu Kang's era, with the role of protagonist going to the Cryomancer Ninja. Let's get something straight. I am not a ninja. I am Lin Kuei. Mink, who was still attached to Direct, revealed in a 2022 interview with Mortal Kombat Online's Realmcast that while Sub-Zero, specifically the younger Kwai Liang, was set to be the main character, the film as a whole would have acted as a Batman Begins-esque reboot of the Mortal Kombat series, rather than a prequel. With a projected budget of $75 million and plans for a PG-13 rating, Mink said Threshold was looking to create an all-ages launchpad for a potential Mortal Kombat cinematic universe. Ray Park was in talks for the role of Johnny Cage, while Jessica Alba was pursued to play Sonya. Pharrell was also approached to orchestrate the film's soundtrack. Unfortunately, with new line out of the process, Kasanoff and Threshold had to secure funding independently, and despite optimism from the filmmakers about the series' potential, they were never able to get the money together from investors. Shortly after, Midway would go bankrupt, with Mortal Kombat and its film rights ending up at Warner Bros. by the end of it. Kasanoff tried to sue to retain ownership, but would ultimately lose hold of the MK license, banishing Threshold's franchise from the realms once and for all. One of MK's most infamous unrealized characters is Mortal Kombat Gold's Belloc. Fans have probably heard the basics of this Lost Fighter story. Belloc was created as an original character for MK Gold's release, and was even shown off in Game Informer, but was cut because of time constraints. This is all technically true, but it's about as accurate as saying Lord of the Rings is about some guys going for a walk. Here's the first movie. And here's the second movie. Belloc was revealed by Game Informer in June of 1999 as part of an online preview for MK Gold. The character hadn't been highlighted by Eurocom or even included in the select screen. Instead, Game Informer had discovered Belloc in the game's practice menu. He had no special moves or fatalities, and a bigger screen didn't help clarify the design of this dinosaur man monster, as Game Informer could only describe him as a quote, creature. The publication made the choice themselves to reveal his existence, attaching six screenshots in the preview, as well as revealing fellow secret character Sector. This came two months before MK Gold hit stores, and Eurocom was shocked. The company gave an interview with Game Informer the next month, stating their surprise that information about Belloc had been released. They elaborated that the character was one of a few features the team was considering including, that they still needed to complete work on him, and that Midway hadn't approved him yet. It was stressed that no decision had been made on whether Belloc would be included in the final game, with Eurocom calling him a possibility. But by August, the developer confirmed Belloc would be left out of MK Gold. In September of 1999, Ed Boon implied in a chat session with Mortal Kombat Online that Midway did eventually approve Belloc's inclusion, and confirmed he was meant to be selected through the question mark behind Tanya's character slot. Unfortunately, the character wasn't able to be completed in time for release. Given the unbalanced and virtually unfinished state of MK Gold's new combatants, and the lack of endings or fatalities for MK4's secret characters, Belloc had to be completely barren content-wise to be left off the roster. It's likely that by the end of development, there was nothing to his character but two textures and a name, though that never kept meat from having fans. Due to the nature of Belloc's discovery, it's possible that he could be playable by the public someday. Preview builds of MK Gold could exist in the hands of collectors, former programmers, or game journalists. And if Belloc was accidentally included in one copy, it's likely he could be in others as well. The character's creation by the now defunct Eurocom means ownership issues would prevent NRS from bringing Belloc back. But someday, somehow, fans may have a way to play as this robot, horse, gladiator thing? Midway was never shy about acknowledging its cash cow franchise, with Mortal Kombat characters making appearances in games like NFL Blitz, MLB Slugfest Loaded, and PsyOps. But their first crossover into another Midway game came in early versions of NBA Jam Tournament Edition, where players were able to select Scorpion, Sub-Zero, Reptile, or Raiden by entering specific birthdays on the selection screen. MK's cast members were included without approval from the NBA, and when the leak found out, they considered it a pretty flagrant foul. 
While the characters were able to get past the NBA for a short while, the league would be more proactive about blocking any future unsanctioned tie-ins. In 2009, Ed Boon took to Twitter to reveal an unused Mortal Kombat stage that was meant for a home port of NBA Jam. Based on MK's Soul Chamber, this grisly arena would have used a spine for a pole, a hollowed out skull for a hoop, and a flayed head as a ball. Try not to be shocked, but the NBA said no. Following the release of 2004's Mortal Kombat Deception, Midway's MK team settled on a clear direction for the future of the MK franchise. Blow it all up! Leading up to the debut of Mortal Kombat Armageddon, Ed Boon spoke about the future of the series from a story perspective, stating that after the events of the latest entry, MK would essentially start fresh. In 2006, Boon told IGN Wii that the idea was to start a new chapter for quote, almost every single aspect of Mortal Kombat, with MK8 featuring new characters, gameplay, and stories. Throughout 2007, plans for a series overhaul continued. In an April interview with CBG, Boon stated that the next game would see a change in tone. After years of an over-the-top, somewhat tongue-in-cheek approach, fans were excited for what could be the most brutal game in the series to date, which is why it came as a shock when, in April 2008, Mortal Kombat vs. DC Universe was announced as the official 8th entry in the series. That's it? With a teen rating and an all-ages approach, the title fell far short of the expectations being built up by MK fans. While its story mode received universal praise, arguably redefining how single-player campaigns are presented in fighting games, the actual game part of the game didn't get the same warm response. Critics took issue with the gimmicky fight mechanics, the undersized roster, and the mismatch of MK's gory nature with DC's family-friendly public face. While MK vs. DC sold well, it wasn't enough to save publisher Midway, who went bankrupt shortly after the game's release. It's not known how much work was done on the original MK8, its new story, or its characters. Pitchwork from artist Vincent Prost would catch fans' attention in 2009, but it was only a pitch, and not indicative of anything the MK team ever planned. MK9 would keep the idea of a fresh start, but NRS would ultimately decide to move in a more familiar direction. The title would be a reboot of the series, going back to its oldest, greatest hits, and retelling the story of the original MK trilogy, something that, for better or worse, they haven't been able to stop doing since. While Mortal Kombat had trouble making it back to the big screen through the 2000s and 2010s, it managed to find surprise success on a much smaller scale through the MK Legacy web series. Two seasons were completed, airing through Machinima.com's YouTube channel. In 2015, it was confirmed that filming for a third season was underway. Titled Mortal Kombat Generations, the series would be a spin-off of Legacy that would act as a tie-in to the recently released Mortal Kombat X. The cast included Casper Van Dyne as Johnny Cage, Boo Boo Stewart as Takeda, Ray Park as Aaron Black, and Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa reprising his role as Shang Tsung from the Threshold films. Louis Tan was also set to play Kung Jin, years before his role in the 2021 film as the unnecessary everyman Cole Young. Daddy, chill. What the hell is even that? Generations was fully filmed and seemingly ready to release, but 2016 came and went with no update on the project's status. The series would never be seen by the public, and neither Warner Bros. or anyone involved in Generations production have ever given an official reason why. While 10 minutes of footage would eventually surface in 2021 through cinematographer Nathan Halgard's Vimeo, the rest of the series has seemingly vanished, with a few behind-the-scenes photos serving as the only proof of its existence. 2005's Mortal Kombat Shaolin Monks was a game that was… pretty decent. But if you're a fan of Mortal Kombat, you know that Pretty Decent is better than the spin-offs usually get. Beat 'em Up retold the story of Mortal Kombat 2, with players controlling Liu Kang and Kung Lao as they horrifically murder all of your favorite characters from the first three games. The title did well enough that shortly after its release, a sequel was considered. Codenamed Fire and Ice, the second entry would have focused on Scorpion and Sub-Zero, who could be unlocked for both verses and story mode in Shaolin Monks. Created by Midway Studios Los Angeles, who handled the first game under the name Paradox, production made it as far as early testing. One demo level was completed, which consisted of Scorpion and Sub-Zero fighting through a wave of enemies, but that was as far as things got. 
Midway LA would shift focus to TNA Impact, which would be the studio's final release before it merged with Midway San Diego. According to Ed Boon, who talked about Fire and Ice in a 2010 interview, the title's cancellation came down to worries that the game couldn't be completed quickly or under budget. It's worth noting, however, that Midway as a company often prioritized quantity over quality, with Mortal Kombat's low point coinciding with the years when the flagship franchise churned out multiple games on an annual basis. In that context, the early early death of Fire and Ice likely had less to do with the lack of ability from those making it, and more to do with the lack of resources available for them to make it with. Writer Gail Simone is mostly known for her work on Batgirl, Birds of Prey, and viral Twitter hashtags, but in 2019, she revealed cancelled plans for a sprawling comics project for Mortal Kombat, one that would have spawned a crossover event that Simone believes could have, quote, changed a comic universe forever. Beginning with a 12-issue maxi-series before branching into three ongoing storylines, plans for the comics began in 2018. While Simone didn't share specifics about the plot, her tweets imply that it could have had repercussions on the mainline DC universe. Unfortunately, it would be NRS themselves who put the project to bed, believing that with MK11 in active development, their team lacked the bandwidth to handle both projects. Mortal Kombat 11 itself would become infamous after release for the crunch employees had to go through to finish it. And while MK comics from industry A-listers would be great to see, it's likely NetherRealm couldn't take much more work without their staff racking up a fatality count. Throughout the life cycle of Mortal Kombat 11, a mountain of evidence suggested that its roster of DLC fighters was always meant to include Evil Dead's Ash Williams. There were early leaks, copyright info in DLC press releases, hints in trailers, tweets from Bruce Campbell, and files on MK11 Switch version with Ash's name. His inclusion in the first combat pack seemed like a foregone result, but when the full pack was revealed, Ash's spot was seemingly taken by the Joker and his files were patched out of the game. Ahead of the announcement for Combat Pack 2, MK voice actor Richard Epcar mentioned in a Q&A on Instagram Live that Ash would be included in the next round of DLC. However, this was deconfirmed by Ed Boon, who stated in a later interview that he couldn't comment on Ash's absence. Campbell himself has hinted that legal complications kept MK from ever getting too groovy, but hasn't elaborated beyond that. Curiously, press releases from before the character's removal credit his appearance to Army of Darkness. The rights to Army of Darkness, the third film in the Evil Dead series, are split between the creators and Universal, which has caused trouble for the series in the past. The television show, Ash vs. Evil Dead, for example, wasn't even allowed to reference the film's events as canon for its first season. Other recent video game appearances by Ash, such as Fortnite and Dead by Daylight, used less legally dubious versions of the character. Evil Dead the Game, which was announced in December of 2020, may have also presented issues, as it's possible Ash's appearance in MK was seen as competing against the new title rather than promoting. Unfortunately, no screenshots or assets of Ash's MK11 appearance have leaked as of 2023. While it's impossible to know for sure what complications kept Ash from introducing Shao Kahn to the wrong end of a boomstick, there's more than enough evidence to definitively say it was part of the original plan. This means that character models, movesets, and voice lines were all likely created and still exist, though were probably destined to remain buried in the NRS vault. In 2008, Capcom released Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix, a game that had as many subtitles as it did characters. The game was an HD remake of Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo, featuring new sprites and updated gameplay. After its announcement, fans of Mortal Kombat hoped the newly established NetherRealm Studios would give a similar treatment to MK's original trilogy. Leaks in 2010 confirmed that the Mortal Kombat HD collection was very real and in development, which made it confusing when in 2011, a barebones collection of ports known as Mortal Kombat Arcade Collection was released instead. While the original MK games haven't received their remake as of 2023, it's not for lack of trying. The MK HD collection was actually one of three attempts by Warner Bros. to update the original games. Unfortunately, none of them panned out. If you want more info on these projects, Matt McMuscles did a great video on their history with exclusive info, and I'm not going to steal his thunder by including it all here. I'll leave a link in the description. 
The files of Mortal Kombat 9 contain a lot of interesting assets that go unused in the final game, including biographies for the game's bosses, arcade endings for Goro and Kentaro, and a gun for Jax that only appears in game when he's on the receiving end of specific fatalities. The most interesting, though, come in the form of unused voice lines for the announcer. The first line is a character select call for the wind god Fujin, and can be accessed by using hacking to select the DLC base male character. Fujin. Newly recorded for MK9, the sound implies that Fujin may have been planned for the game's roster. By release, Fujin's only appearance in the game would be a small cameo in Kratos' arcade ending. And while the Wind God appeared in the story mode of MKX, it would be nearly 10 more years before he would be playable again, headlining MK11's 2020 Aftermath expansion with a redesigned Shiva and... <sighs> Robocop. You don't belong here. The other sound is for Brutalities, a finisher which at that point had made its first and last mainline appearance in Ultimate MK3. Ed Boon confirmed in May 2011, shortly after the release of MK9, that the team had tried to implement Brutalities, with a working system that he called, quote, pretty cool, but time constraints kept it from being implemented. It's likely that the idea was carried over to the series' next entry, MKX, where Brutalities made a prominent return as unique finishers tied to specific character moves and conditions. On a fundamental level, some things just don't go well together. There's religion and politics, the office, and comedy, and then there's Mortal Kombat and all ages content. The series' attempts to reach outside of its M-rated roots has resulted in some of the weakest output of the franchise. Just look at the lackluster MK vs. DC, the horrendous Malibu comics, the MK Live Tour, and The Journey Begins. That's right, keep moving! You know what? You know what? Yeah. Except you, you stay! Mortal Kombat's attempts to branch out of its core demographic have ranged from poorly planned to downright cynical, but none of them are as confusing as the unreleased kids cartoon, MK Ultra Girls. Ultra Girls was conceived by WB executives who thought the franchise had an all-ages market appeal beneath its gory facade, which should sound familiar. With 26 episodes supposedly completed, the series would have focused on Cassie Cage, Jackie Briggs, and Frost in a high school setting where students fought to decide the future fate of the next Armageddon event. It featured what sounded like some very on-the-nose ideas, including Stryker as a hall monitor, Meat as a science class experiment, Cobra as a karate teacher, and Rain as a popular pretty boy. Which is valid. The character designs were done by YouTuber Rebel Taxi, though he since stressed that he had nothing to do with the writing. The series was revealed in 2021 by a staff member who leaked the project's existence on Reddit, as well as details on its production and silent cancellation. Ultra Girls was supposedly set to be revealed after the announcement of Scorpion's Revenge, but the show never materialized. As of 2023, no further details on the series have emerged. As strange as it seems, MK Ultra Girls looks to be a very real project, and while its 26 episodes likely won't see an official release anytime soon, it doesn't mean they'll never see the light of day. Mortal Kombat Special Forces is infamous as both the low point of the Midway produced games and a low point of fifth generation gaming as a whole. You want some fries with that whoop ass? It's often noted as one of the worst titles of the era, standing alongside Superman 64, Bubsy 3D, and Mortal Kombat Advance. The poor quality of reptile wins. The poor flawless victory. The poor quality of Special Forces came as the result of a rushed development cycle owed to studio mandates, with series co-creator John Tobias leaving Midway with several other staff members during production. Changes made to complete the title on time took a drastic toll that left cutscenes, gameplay features, and even versions for other consoles on the cutting room floor. Versions for the N64 and Dreamcast were planned, but cancelled in the crunch. The story also saw a massive overhaul. 
Originally, Special Forces was supposed to feature two separate story modes, one for Jax and one for Sonya, who was left out completely from the final game. This early version of Special Forces also featured different characters. For example, Cabal was featured as a member of the Black Dragon, showing his time with the organization before his iconic scarring, but also after Jax got his metal arms? That doesn't... hold on. It would take 20 years, but a build featuring Sonya would surface in 2020, giving fans a chance to see that one of the worst games ever could have been marginally better. It may not be a masterpiece, but the prototype shows that the vision and scope for Special Forces were betrayed by the final product, or more accurately, the company that forced it into what it was. In 2000, Threshold Entertainment launched the incredibly low-budget Mortal Kombat Federation of the Martial Arts. I hear you've been hanging out with Shang Tsung. Watch what you say about your future master. An ambitious concept for early 21st century internet, Federation of the Martial Arts was an ongoing webcast fight league that doubled as an online stockbrokering game. Players could bet on fighters and the outcomes of their matches, with videos posted to the site including ongoing storylines as well. One in particular made use of the character Ruby from the Defenders of the Realm cartoon. Production slowed down over the course of the year, with Federation of the Martial Arts posting its final video in April of 2001. While there were reportedly talks of a network television version done in conjunction with UPN, those plans never materialized. All 15 fights and supplementary videos from Federation of the Martial Arts have been recovered, but its extensive web community, including leaderboards, The Pit, The Earthrealm Report, and a blog from Raiden with a Y, are all lost, locked behind sign-up pages that can't be accessed through the Wayback Machine. While none of it is likely groundbreaking or probably even worth reading at all, the promotional material and member content that couldn't be preserved represents a unique snapshot of the MK fandom 20 years ago, one that seems to be permanently lost to time. WWE Immortals was a fighting game released for mobile devices in 2015. The game took real wrestlers and transformed them into fantasy heroes, similar to the Backstreet Boys McDonald's figures or Disney's Mirrorverse game. The title was made by NetherRealm Studios and played similarly to mobile versions of Mortal Kombat and Injustice. In 2015, the team included a personal touch when they added Johnny Cage as an unlockable fighter. Two variations of the character would be made playable, marking Cage's first appearance outside of a Mortal Kombat game since Daniel Casino wore the costume to promote competing arcade game Bloodstorm. Unfortunately, WWE Immortals was shut down in 2019. Even if those interested managed to access the game through APK files, the closure of its servers and stores, as well as Cage's limited time availability in the game, leave him inaccessible to anyone who hasn't managed to keep the title running on their phone for the past half decade. Did you hear about any of these cancelled projects as they were happening? And what MK Lost Media would you want to see found? Let me know in the comments. And thanks for watching. I make all these videos myself, and I'm thankful for any time people are willing to give them. If you want more Lost Media, check my channel. But for now, I'm gonna go play MK1 for three months straight.